Welcome everyone. This is going to be our 60th annual general meeting of the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. Right, before getting to the main business, I'd just like, as president, to say a few words to you. So, 60th AGM, and as Debbie has said, the 60th AGM, like the 59th, is a bit odd. It's being held on an evening, it's being held midweek, and of course, it's being held online. So, thanks for coming along. Looking at the number of participants, it's now up to 202. So, in fact, we're getting more members joining us for our AGM than we would when we were in a hall together. So thanks for coming along. Uh, what's really unique though about this 60th AGM is that it's being held at exactly the same time as COP26, a few hundred miles north of us. And it, both meetings, are concerned with the planet that we all live on. And I, I think of COP and the Trust as opposite ends of a spectrum of concern for the planet that we all share. One sphere of concern is global, and the other, that's us, has a sphere of influence which is much more local at a county level. And we deal with specific places and we activate our plans through particular people. And just talking of people, I think the very simplistic way of uh, dividing people into two camps is to just ask you, is this glass half full or is it half empty? The, in relation to the environment, this is a split between those who tend to be pessimistic as far as the future is concerned. They're perhaps subject to almost a culture of despair. On the other hand, the glass half full people, whilst worried and anxious, they are still optimistic about our shared future. So today the charity will report on the last year. It will suggest what lies ahead. And I'd just like to finish by saying that the Queen yesterday told COP26 that it was a significant endeavour. Now, I think that our Wildlife Trust is, is also a significant endeavour. And what will emerge by the end of this evening will reinforce, I think, those people who believe that the glass is half full. We hope that while still being concerned, you're going to receive an extra boost of hope and encouragement from what is our joint endeavour. Right, so on with the business. The programme is that I shall run the AGM in a, sim a way which is as normal as possible. It's the annual opportunity for you, the members, to receive a report from the chairman of the board and from the treasurer. It's not from the executive of the trust. And it will be about the business year 2020 to 2021. And we're going to ask you to confirm your agreement on those reports. And then also on the agenda tonight is the election of trustees and the appointment of the auditors. I shall close the formal meeting then and hand back to Debbie 
who will be reflecting on the Trust's development and achievements over the whole of the past six decades, as well as reporting on the progress to date of the Wilder strategy, and then what may come ahead, the plans going forward. And then David, as chairman, will welcome Craig Bennett, and then chair a final Q&A session, which you will have the opportunity to put your questions to Debbie, to David, to the senior management team and to Craig. Now, it's time for item four, which is the report from the chairman, David Jordan. And then following this will be item five, the treasurer's report from Richard Green Wilkinson. And then after David and Richard have done their presentations, I'll invite questions on both their reports. So it would be helpful if you wait until they've finished before you start typing your questions into the channel. Right, I'll hand over to David to give his report as chairman of the board. Thank you very much indeed, uh, John, and good evening, everyone. Um, delighted to be with you albeit on a virtual basis it's my uh, honor and of course duty to report to you on the financial year ending 31st of march 2021 but as you would expect i'll be taking the opportunity just to bring out a few facts and figures uh for items which have taken place in the last six or seven months since the end of march could i have the next slide please As Debbie said, there's perhaps a little bit of a delay in the in the slides. I hope you'll bear with us on on that. Now, I've entitled this, and it pretty much covers the whole of my report. Um, Thriving in a period of, of uncertainty, because to me that encapsulates the year in question. And I hope to bring this to life over the next uh, handful of minutes or so. Uh, so, our land estate. Uh, we've continued to manage our existing land estate to great effect for wildlife, but we've made some significant acquisitions during the period, which we're really pleased with, and I'm sure you are too as, as members. And I'll just give you a couple of examples uh, on my next slide. Our membership, despite the fact that during the prime recruitment period uh, last year, we were unable to undertake any face-to-face -face recruitment because of, of coronavirus, our membership has continued to grow. And you, you will know from previous AGMs the importance that I and colleagues uh, attach to this. And I, again, I'll give you a little bit more detail in just a moment. Our influence has, has, um, has also been important. A couple of examples of where we bring influence to bear. Firstly, in terms of planning issues uh, and, and our campaign against the wholly unsustainable proposals to develop housing at Tipner West is a very good example of that. But of course, our work with farmers to help work with them uh, to farm for and with wildlife and on perhaps a more sustainable footing. Very, very important work that we undertake. And again, our finances, uh, a mixed story here. You'll hear much more detail from Richard, our treasurer, in just a moment or two. Um, there's been some ups and downs, but overall, it's been a good year uh, for finances with a downward trend uh, on restricted finances, which is really to do with the way in which uh, some of our work has been held back through coronavirus. Next slide, please. So the next slide talks a little bit about three of the uh, key acquisitions last year. Little Ducksmore on the Isle of Wight, and of course we're transforming our land holdings uh, on the Isle of Wight, really positive stuff. Little Ducks Moor is, is our first real rewilding site where we've bought uh, farmland, which is a very low uh, wildlife value, and we'll be working to transform that over the coming years to produce something which I believe is going to be fabulous. Deacon Hill, uh, fantastic for butterflies, including, of course, the Duke of Burgundy, is a site that we've been hoping to get probably for the last two decades. And it's fantastic that this was, was uh, achieved in the last financial year. Emma Bog and uh, Baddersley Common, 
uh, you, you, if you know the site, you'll know it's a funny old shape. Well, we've filled in one of the uh, pieces of the jigsaw. It's a much, much better shape now and a great place for wildlife and really bring, brings to life the whole mantra about more, bigger and uh, better and more joined up. Next slide, please. I talked about our, our, our membership. This actually shows our membership over the full 60 years of our, our life. And uh, as of the end of October this year, so what, three days ago, um, our membership stood at that 27,722, tantalizingly close to the peak we reached in 2010, I believe, uh, only 65 members short. Uh, and I would, I would love it if we could uh, punch through that uh, peak, uh, perhaps even this side of Christmas. Next slide, please. Our ambitious strategy, which we launched two years ago, many of you were uh, present at the launch, many of you will have taken part in all of the things that we've been doing since then, with a vision of 30% of land and sea where nature is recovering by 2030, our 30 by 30 mantra, if you like, now reflected right across the movement across the UK. More people on nature's side and the team has worked uh, tirelessly dis and fantastic results. Even though it's been so hard to meet face to face, we've really brought many, many more people, communities, schools, individuals, uh, further on nature's side. And reintroducing lost species. This is something that is uh, part of our strategy and something that we're very keen on and currently working on in some detail. Next slide, please. Other notable achievements in, in, uh, in the year in question. We've set up a new conservation and science advisory panel. Uh, this is a group of independent science experts from our two counties chaired by one of our uh, trustees. And that conservation uh, uh, panel is advising us on the science that should and must underpin uh, the decisions that we bring to bear through our strategy. Improving diversity. This is not biodiversity I'm talking about. This is about human diversity. It's about the diversity of thought and opinion and advice that we seek. And we've actually established two new associate trustee roles. These are not governance roles. They take full part in the uh, discussions of council, but do not have voting powers and therefore are appointed by council, not elected by the AGM. And I'm delighted to welcome Alex as our first associate trustee. Watercress and Winterbourne's project continues to uh, speak up for our precious uh, chalk streams, which are so vulnerable to pollution, low flows, climate change. And of course, we saw a pretty devastating pollution in the river test earlier this year. We've done a lot of work on nature-based solutions. This is a growing area for us. What does nature do? What can nature do to sequester carbon? Not just through woodland creation, uh, but also um, at sea, blue carbon. What can nature do for, um, for uh, water quality, for flood risk uh, re reduction, and indeed for uh, uh, pollution control and uh, uh, nitrate reduction. This will be and is and will be a, continue to be a very important area for us. Next slide, please. This, of course, has not come free and some of the costs have been high. The impact of COVID the impact of being furloughed, the impact of your job coming to an end, albeit temporarily, has been significant. And of course, people have had to pick up extra workloads. The, the workload impacts on our staff have been significant. And we've been very careful to ensure that our staff are, are, are looked after in that context. The impact of poor behavior on some of our sites I reported uh, last year, uh, and of course, again, has, has continued this year and it really brings to light I think the, the the fact that we have a lot of work to do to help people understand and value and engage constructively with with nature and to bring them onto to nature's side 
a lot of work to do. Uh, next slide, please. So while well, uh, my last slide is, is, is building, this is an opportunity for me just to summarize. I think it's been a fantastic year for the Trust in a period of great uncertainty. The impacts have not been without uh, significance, but I think it's been really good, a great balance of acquisitions, managing our estate to great effect uh, and bringing more pe people onto nature's side and developing our uh, further understanding of nature-based solutions. So an opportunity for me to finish by thanking so many people, our volunteers who do a phenomenal amount on our, on our reserves to the benefit of, of nature. Uh, our donors and supporters, without whom we couldn't possibly operate, of course. Uh, several people have left us legacies, which have been fabulous, albeit with a, within a sad context. Um, our members, without whom we simply wouldn't exist. We're, innate, uh, we're a membership-based uh, organisation, as you know. And, of course, my fellow trustees who have worked with me and the fantastic team of directors led by Debbie, uh, for the entire period in, in question. Thank you all very much indeed. John, back to you. Well, great stuff there. Thanks on behalf of the members. Thank you, David. Thank you. So, on to the next uh, part of the agenda, which is the Treasurer's Report. Uh, I welcome Richard Green Wilkinson to present his report. Over to you, Richard. Thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. Well, I hope you've got a copy of the financial report and accounts. Uh, if not, they're available on the website. So I just intend to take 10 minutes to highlight the main points of interest. So the year ended 31st March 2021, a year of COVID and lockdown. Difficult to remote for new members, hard to obtain donations and grants, a reduction in restricted fund projects and all other restrictions that lockdown imposed. And yet, next slide please. An operating surplus on unrestricted funds of 228,000 pounds, excluding legacies and investment movements. A truly amazing result. Huge congratulations to Debbie, Natasha and the whole team. Of course, especially due to tight budgeting and controls and accurate forecasting. Next slide, please. Well, that's beautiful. That's the Duke of Burgundy that David was talking about. So total income for the year was 6.7 million compared with 6.4 million last year. This was made up of 5 million of unrestricted income and 1.7 million of restricted income. Next slide, please. So just looking at the unrestricted income, of course, as the name implies, um, this is uh, available for uh, the trustees to support the charities, the trust charitable objectives. Um, the unrestricted income for the year was up to just over five million pounds, an increase from just under four million in 1920 and includes membership income, which was up to 1.22 million. Um, which is very good. And as David mentioned, um, the num members, number of members exceeds 27,700. So that's excellent. The next line, the legacy income, 859,000 pounds. That's incredible. Uh, we are so grateful for legacies. We do not budget for them and it's hugely beneficial in carrying out our work. So that's great. Donations of 223,000 received against all aspects of our work and activities a reduction due to reduced activity. And the nitrate reduction program generated a net income of 300,000 pounds towards the acquisition of Little Duxmoor Farm. Next slide, please. So what about restricted income? Well, of course, this comes with restrictions from the donors to how the money can be spent. The total this year was quite a bit down as David has alluded to earlier to 1.7 million compared with 2.4 million last year. And two uh, reasons for this, principally, part of the reduction is due to the funding of a, a number of large projects having been received in advance for the last two years and then to be spent in 2021 onwards. And of course, the other one, additionally, some of the grant funded projects were on hold during the pandemic. Next slide, please. 
So pictorially, income trends over the past five years, the blue line is the unrestricted income, which you see an uptick in the 2021 year. The red line is the restricted income. So that's gone down and the total is the green line. So it's, uh, it's good to see that uh, there's a gradual increase in the total income. Next slide, please. So moving on to expenditure, total expenditure for the year was 4.88 million, just 61,000 higher than the previous year. Conservation, education, engagement work spend was 9% higher. Membership expenditure decreased due to recruitment activity reducing as a result of lockdown and pandemic. But crucially, expenditure on the IT infrastructure upgrade project continued, very important for uh, remote working due to lockdowns and that will continue for future years. Next slide, please. So moving on to a bit more of expenditure analysis, 4.38 million, 90% of the total expenditure was on our charitable activities. So conservation, education and engagement, and advocacy and membership services. The remaining 10% was spent on raising funds and included in both these figures are the related support costs. Support costs also include our annual contribution to the Wildlife Trusts at national level for their policy, advocacy and coordination work on behalf of all the individual wildlife trusts. Next slide, please. Here we go again, uh, pictorially, uh, you can see the, the trends here, the uh, blue line being unrestricted, the red line being restricted and the green line being the total. And it's nice to see that the green line is, is pretty flat the last couple of years, um, just what we want. Next slide, please. Right, moving on to investments. Um, we currently have just over a million pounds in investments, and this is likely to increase. So effective management of investments is very important to us. The Trust's investment portfolio continues to be managed by CCLA through their Charities Ethical Investment Fund. Over the years, CCLA have offered good returns to their clients while screening systematically on a wide range of areas, including biodiversity and climate change, and actively working with companies on ethical issues. The fund does not invest in companies producing or refining oil and gas. Right. CCLA continues to restrict investment in companies with a high carbon footprints, which do not comply with the Paris Agreement. That's good too. But even better, an unrealized gain over the year of just over £200,000 on investments a 20% gain on top of 3% income, an excellent performance. And of course, this is in addition to our operating surplus. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, COVID-19 had a big impact and uh, it's important to just say a few words about that. Um, as you know, it came in right at the end of the 1920 year and was fully in in 2021, including the lockdowns and continues to affect the current financial year for the Trust. So 2021, dominated by COVID-19, but we have taken robust financial measures, management measures to ensure costs are kept under control. Really important that. And the Trust continues to regularly reforecast its income and expenditure and has applied for external emergency funding, including local authority grants, funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, and of course, the government's furlough, furlough scheme during the period. Face to face recruitment was stopped during each lockdown and has now resumed in line with COVID 19 guidelines. Some scheduled work was postponed and other activities adapted for delivery online during the period. And we continue to review this as we move forward. Next slide, please. So, what does this all mean for the Trust? Well, whilst the COVID-19 situation continues to dominate, we have a great deal of important work underway. We are aware that the biodiversity and climate change crises haven't gone away, have they? COP26, COP of course. Looking ahead, there are financial challenges to overcome and continued uncertainties to manage. We will continue to maintain strong budgetary control and to look for new and diversified sources of income. We are more grateful than ever to our loyal members and supporters who enable us to continue the work to meet our charitable objectives. Thank you. Next slide, please. 
So we're nearly there. I'd just like to leave you with a financial summary. Um, the annual report and accounts are prepared in accordance with the charity's sort, as you would expect, audited by ASITS, thank you ASITS, and a clean audit report. The year ended with total assets of 13.4 million, surplus of 2 million, unrealized gain in investments of just over 200,000, and a gain due to the revaluation of fixed assets for 119,000. A very satisfactory year in the circumstances. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Richard, for your report. Again, a fantastic report. So shortly, we're going to be voting on the approval of these annual report and accounts. Before we do so, though, uh, there's an opportunity for you to ask questions on anything you've heard from David or from Richard. So we have a short period of time. As you know, there is another Q&A at the end of the evening. So please don't feel uh, upset if I don't take your question. It may be done later. At the moment, here's a question I th my guess is it's for Debbie from David Yandel. How can we address the problem of bad behavior on the trust's sites? Yes, Debbie. thank <laughs> you, David. That's an uh, excellent question. And if I could wave a magic wand, um, I would. I think, uh, what I suppose part of what to, to say, first of all, is it isn't just us. I'm sure you've seen in the press, um, all of the landowning charities, national trust, local authorities, we've all suffered. There are a few things we're doing. We've invested in um, a new position of visitor engagement manager who's starting soon. We're also using our behaviour change expertise, and I'll say a little bit more about that later on, actually, to see if we can engage visitors uh, more constructively. Uh, we're also looking at upgrading some of our infrastructure, some of our signage, that sort of thing. Um, and of course, the more we can uh, um, sort of bring local communities to help um, and raise awareness, of course, that all helps. You know, I don't think there's a one, one size, one easy fix for this. What I would say, though, is when we had the particularly bad issues um, at Tesswood last summer, what was amazing was how the volunteers and the community, the local police um, uh, and all the neighbours all really rallied round and really helped us. So, you know, we'll continue to do as much as we can. A lot of this is around education. And of course, I suppose the other quick thing to say is um, one of the other things, of course, is to really promote more green infrastructure and more space um, on the back of things like planning and, and new development. So that there's more space for people that can go out um, and use that. So they're not always having to resort to going to nature reserves. But thanks for your question. Thanks, Debbie. I think the next one here is also for you, and it comes from David's report, because uh, he mentioned the Winterbournes project. This is from Belinda Hallam, who is a trust member, but also belongs to the Whitewater Valley Preservation Society. And her question is, given the wider chalk stream environment in the county in Hampshire of the River Whitewater and the wider lodge and catchment. How can other societies collaborate better with the trust to have a greater impact? Thanks, Belinda. Yeah, I mean, you've probably seen, um, I mean, maybe we can pick this up a bit more later on in our discussion. Um, but yeah, the Loddon is suffering, as are most of our chalk streams. Um, you know, we've got issues with um, ammonia and also runoff and things like that. We've also got pressures from, from house building. Um, collaboration is always key. I feel there may well be a, a bit more of a water campaign brewing, actually, particularly on the back of the stuff we've seen in the press about, um, you know, the sort of sewage issues, uh, water pollution more generally. Um, we've been talking to a lot of other partners um, about perhaps putting even more pressure um, on the Environment Agency and the government and the water companies who frankly haven't really been doing their duty. 
um, we did, we were asked to go to a, a meeting with Maria Miller not that long ago to have a discussion about the Loddon um, and the issues up there. So please stay in touch, um, Belinda, with us. And we're always really happy to collaborate with local groups, particularly if you've got evidence or anything like that, that we can kind of add into campaigns um, and see if we can, you know, really push to get our, our rivers in better condition. What's shocking is that our rivers, I think it's 0% of our rivers are in good condition in this country, which, you know, frankly is abysmal, isn't it? So the more we can do, the better. Thanks, Thanks Debbie. Thanks. Uh, time for just one more question. This is from Joan Swain. I think it's for Richard. Has the trust benefited from any government grants such as furlough? Thank you. Yes. Um, I think, Joan, yes, uh, absolutely. Certainly the furlough scheme um, and also local authority grants and National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, I, I just wonder whether uh, Natasha might be able to tell you sort of more specific amounts involved. Do you, do you have those, that sort of detail, Natasha, handy? Hello. I don't actually have the amounts, but I can tell you that we furloughed around 40% of our staff for a period of between three and four months of the first uh, lockdown. And we then brought our staff back to enable us to start uh, trying to do different types of activity like online um, uh, events and things like that. But we did make use of the furlough. And as Richard said, we made uh, use of a couple of local government grants when we had to shut some of our education centres. They helped us uh, sort of pay for uh, keeping them up and running, um, although not open. So, yes, hope that answers your question. Thank you. Welcome to the second part of our uh, annual meeting. Hope you managed to grab a drink or something in that uh, very short break and I'll settle back uh, for this next session which um, will involve two, two presentations followed by uh, questions uh, where you can ask any questions about the, the Trust's work. So before I invite Debbie to start her presentation, I would uh, very much like to, to welcome Craig Bennett. Craig is the Chief Exec of the Wildlife Trust. Some of you may better know that as the Royal Society of Wildlife Trusts. Uh, Craig, I, I, I'm pretty sure you've managed to join us. Uh, if you can turn your camera on, um, just so that people can see you, that would be that would be lovely. Hello, David. I'm I'm here. Hopefully, you can see and hear me. I can, Craig. Welcome um, from Glasgow, where you're at COP26, and we very much look forward to hearing from you after uh, Debbie's presentation. Uh, so, if you and I can turn our microphones off now. I'm going to hand over to Debbie. Debbie, take it away. Thank you very much, David and Craig. Absolutely great that you're with us tonight. OK, so I've got a 10 minute whiz through the last 60 years. So hello, everyone. It's my great privilege to be speaking to you today at our 60th AGM. And as you've heard earlier, this past 18 months has been, you know, really, really challenging. And yet strangely rewarding uh, uh, in my 23 years, can you believe, with, with the Wildlife Trust, it's been quite a ride the last year. Uh, the impact of the pandemic has been obviously very stressful, um, but we have continued to deliver amazing things for nature um, with your support, which has been absolutely brilliant. But before I talk about the future, I'm going to take a few moments to reflect on the last 60 years at this important moment in the trust history. Next slide. Are my slides moving? They're supposed to move automatically, but it doesn't appear to have gone yet. There we go. Thank you. Back in 1961, when the trust was uh, established, our founding members uh, established charity in a set of sound principles and key themes that have actually stood the test of time remarkably well. Establishing nature reserves, special places for wildlife, campaigning for wildlife, helping everyone to learn about nature and working with our neighbours um, as part of that local community. Really, really important themes. Securing and managing nature reserves, of course, has long been 
core to our work. And back in the 1970s, that was a really important time for the Trust when we took on a number of major acquisitions, building a significant portfolio of important wildlife sites. Pictured here is Royden Woods, still our largest nature reserve today, a thousand acres in the New Forest, gifted to the Trust by Peter Barker Mill. Lower Test Marshes was established under a long lease with the same family at that time, and St Catherine's Hill, one of the original sites from the 1915 Rothschild list, has been in our care since that time too. And in the 1980s, a substantial legacy from Miss Jane Dutton gave the Trust real financial stability for the first time. We benefited from other significant gifts in that period too, such as Edith Whitehead's legacy gift of Chappet's Cops. Since then, we've acquired more and more nature reserves and we're still doing it today. We now have the grand total of more than 4,600 hectares of land for wildlife, making a huge contribution to the biodiversity of our two counties. But many of our nature reserves and other important wildlife sites have been at the heart of various campaigns over the years, coming under attack because of damaging development proposals, in the 1990s, we had to defend Farlington Marshes against the proposed relocation of Portsmouth Football Club. Many of you will remember the well-supported campaign to save Dibden Bay from port expansion, which was successful back uh, nearly 15 years ago. And other campaigns such as the protests against the infamous M3 cutting at Twyford Down sadly failed. Despite wildlife legislation getting stronger over the last 60 years, the need to campaign hasn't gone away. Indeed, we're currently fighting proposals to concrete over 27 hectares of intertidal habitat at Tipner West, uh, as you've heard about earlier. Helping people to learn about nature has always been important to the Trust, and we've educated and inspired hundreds of thousands of people to discover wildlife over the decades. In the 1990s and 2000s, we established our education centres at Blashford, Swanwick and Tesswood. And these also coincided with the concept of multi-purpose green space close to urban areas and settlements, which is a theme of even more relevance today as people are really starting to value the importance of nature on their doorstep. Offering advice and assistance to farmers and landowners using our expertise and knowledge has always been a vital part of our work. And in the last 10 years, we have provided land management advice to over 50,000 hectares of private land across our two counties. From 2009 onwards, our work in the marine environment really ramped up following the passing of vital legislation, the Marine Act to protect our seas. We undertook vast amounts of survey work and research to influence the creation of the first marine conservation zones and to influence more responsible use of the sea. Examples include radio tracking seals and mapping and surveying seagrass beds. By the mid to late 2000s, the Trust had grown to be a significant player developing visions, partnerships, strategic programmes for ambitious landscape scale, nature conservation, and ecological recovery over much larger areas. Major achievements included the influential, if initially controversial, river restoration work at Whittle Moors in Winchester, which showed there could be a much wilder approach to fishing, and the establishment of our 15 year partnership <clears throat> with the MOD in Hampshire, North Hampshire to restore 2000 hectares of heathland landscapes together with the establishment of our uh, grazing herds uh, and the farms to support them. And this brings us to now, to the 2020s. I would say that this decade, 2030, is probably the most critical in our history. Despite the amazing work we've done together over 60 years, uh, our wildlife is not doing so well in the wider countryside. We have more knowledge than ever before, more understanding about the natural world, and we know that it's really in, in serious trouble. So two years ago, we launched our wilder strategy, a real call to action, our response to the nature crisis. It set out a bold plan to get more people on nature's side and create much more space for wildlife to thrive with our two overarching initiatives, Team Wilder and Wilder Land and Sea. 
Since then, though, we went straight almost straight into the COVID pandemic um, after the launch, and that has been really tough, as we've already talked about, and been a bit of a distraction in many ways. Um, although we have managed to continue uh, delivering amazing things for wildlife. But I think it's really interesting that since the pandemic, a lot has changed and public concern for the environment mm -hmm. is now at an all time high. And this opinion poll uh, from two months ago shows it incredibly high, the highest since the 1980s. And of course, as we sit here tonight, climate change is at the top of the political agenda and it's our job to make those links between the climate crisis and the nature crisis. In a few minutes, we'll hear from Craig Bennett, uh, the CEO of the Wildlife Trust. In the past 18 months since Craig joined, we've been working together on a new shared strategy for the whole movement. Our shared strategy has three goals, which fortunately fit very well with our own wilder strategy and the work we're doing here. The first is nature and recovery. As long as, as well as protecting wildlife, we've got to put nature into recovery. This includes restoring degraded land and whole ecosystems to a point where at least 30% of our land and sea is in recovery for nature by 2030. More than just helping people to learn about and connect with nature, which is still important, we've got to build a movement of people taking action for the environment leading to better decisions, stronger laws, and more resources for conservation. And to really ramp up investment in nature's recovery, it must be recognised as a solution to local and global problems. Nature's role in drawing carbon dioxide out of the air, removing pollution, preventing flooding must be acknowledged and funded in a way that helps us create more space for wildlife. And to bring our strategy to life, we're focusing on a few key areas where we hope to deliver real maximum impact. So I'm sure you know we've been investing heavily in the Isle of Wight for the last sort of few years to expand our work and really demonstrate there what nature recovery looks like. We've more than doubled our land holding in the last five years, we acquired significant stretches of the Eastern Yarra Valley, uh, for example at New Chech Moors, which I know many of you donated to, and extensive areas of agricultural land, uh, such as Little Ducksmoor Farm. And soon, we hope, uh, another large uh, arable site. Our plans there are rewilding, wetland restoration, uh, and beavers, which I'll talk about more uh, later. Our Team Wilder programme, really, really important. We've had over a thousand people sign up, and more than 30 groups. And we're now seeing initiatives ranging from wilder schools to wilder streets to campaigning for change. And what's different about this is we're using behaviour change science and movement building techniques to really start to grow momentum, again, leading to better decision making and a broader diversity of people taking action for nature in their communities. And finally, just a little more on nature based solutions. We've been piloting how rewilding former agricultural land can start to help mitigate the nitrates impact of planned housing in the Solent. We're also keen to develop more nature-based solutions such as carbon drawdown through ecosystem restoration. And we're currently investigating the potential for massive seagrass restoration throughout the Solent as a blue carbon solution. And our beaver reintroduction program, although it's great for biodiversity, is also a nature-based solution because that restoration will, will deliver wider benefits. In closing, then, I'll just come back to our amazing nature reserves. In our 60th year, we wanted to celebrate and highlight our amazing nature reserves with our anniversary appeal. Thanks so much to everyone who has donated and shared stories and comments uh, and told us how much you love our nature reserves. We've received some brilliant comments and we've raised over £60,000 in a few short weeks. With this additional funding, we'll give a boost to our existing sites, paying for equipment or work on the ground, uh, and every penny will go to our reserves. So that's it, short and sweet this year. Um, I've had less time so that we've got plenty of time for Craig and questions and answers, but just a huge thank you. We can't do any of the work we do without you and your unwavering support and your generosity, particularly in this most difficult of years, is just hugely appreciated by all of us and, of course, by our amazing wildlife. So thank you very much. I'm really happy to answer questions later, but it's now my great pleasure to hand over to Craig 
uh, our World Actress CEO, who, as you know, is in Glasgow at COP26. So hi, Craig. And I will let, hand over to you to uh, address our members. Thank you very much. Sorry how rushed that was, but I uh, had a lot to cover in 10 minutes. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie, and good evening, everyone. It's fantastic to be able to be joining you from Glasgow, where I arrived uh, early yesterday to be here at COP26 on behalf of the Wildlife Trust as a whole. And I'm going to be here for the whole two weeks with uh, a couple of members of my team, making sure we really get the message out there around uh, how the climate emergency, the nature emergency are linked, intrinsically linked, and you can't solve one without solving the other. More of that later. Um, but thank you so much for inviting me to join you tonight at this AGM. It's really important to do so, and I love to be able to join individual wildlife trusts at their AGMs and other meetings. It's a sort of a really good thing to do. And great to hear from Debbie there as well about that presentation. There is some incredible work going on in your wildlife trust. And I really want to start by saying a huge thank you, actually, to both Debbie and David, uh, your chair, who both of whom have made me feel very welcome when I started the Wildlife Trusts a year and a half ago. I started on April the 1st, 2020, which was an interesting date to start in this job. Uh, and have, uh, both Debbie and David have really uh, made me feel welcome and helped me a lot over this last year, particularly in relation to the development of that strategy that Debbie was talking about. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But first of all, since I did start last year, as I said, on April the 1st, there should have been a clue there, shouldn't there, that it was gonna be a bit of an interesting start to this job. Um, I wanna sort of share with you some of the things I learned about the Wildlife Trust as I came into the job. I thought I knew the Wildlife Trusts really well. I've been a member of my local Wildlife Trust since I was a teenager. And uh, so I thought I knew the Wildlife Trust, but when I came into this job and learned more about the Federation as a whole, some of the statistics I found absolutely astonishing. And I'm gonna share them with you because they were kind of news to me. You may well know that Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust is one of 46 individual locally run uh, independent wildlife trusts, 46 wildlife trusts right across the UK, covering every single part of the UK, ranging from county wildlife trusts to some that cover groups of smaller counties, to uh, several in Wales, and uh, to our national wildlife trusts like Scottish Wildlife Trust and uh, Ulster Wildlife as well. And then of course we have the Isle of Man and Ordinary Wildlife Trust as well, which I have to say separately because they're not technically part in the UK, of course, but uh, very work very, very closely with them. So it's 46 wildlife trusts in total. What you might not know is just the sheer number of nature reserves we have across the wildlife trusts. It's actually, we've got more nature reserves than McDonald's has got restaurants in this country, which I always find a really good statistic to share. In fact, we've got a thousand more and we estimate that 60% of the British population live within a three mile walk or cycle ride of a wildlife trust nature reserve. And that I think more than anything demonstrates what is so special and unique about the wildlife trust. It is that we are about your local wildlife and the work we do in those individual trusts is all about delivering that kind of local uh, action for wildlife, but together, collectively as a wildlife trust federation we're delivering national impact and i should also say we're doing that as part of a kind of global movement to put nature in recovery right around the world uh, the wildlife trust was actually one of the founding members of the international union for the conservation of nature back in the 1940s something we should be really proud of given just the scale of the I and importance that IUCN has now grown to over the last few years. So the Wildlife Trust has always been at the forefront of that, that work to put nature in recovery and protect nature locally, but as part of a national, uh, delivering national impact and as part of a global context. And I think that's a really, really special combination that we have at the Wildlife Trusts. Now, when I came into the job, what was very clear and all the chief execs, not least Debbie, were saying to me, it's like, you know, we are in this climate ecological emergency. We have to really make sure that the 2020s are a decade where our work really counts and actually starts to help turn around all these trends that are going in the wrong direction. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm, I've got really fed up of seeing all these graphs of species declines and hearing about species going extinct and, and all these graphs pointing in the wrong direction for nature. We don't just want to slow the decline in nature, we want to stop it and reverse it and see nature put in recovery. 
So what Debbie was talking about there is that we've developed a, a new strategy over this last year that is about how all the wildlife trusts can work even more closely together and really make sure that all our individual work is joining up to deliver that national impact contributing to that global context and those kind of global solutions. So I'm just going to give you a very quick overview of some of the highlights of that strategy. First of all, as Debbie was saying, there's those three big goals. And again, we really have to pay tribute to Hampshire and Isle Wight Trust here for offering kind of leadership across the wider wildlife trust movement of the thinking, the thought leadership that's contributed so much to this strategy, because we really have drawn a lot from the Hampshire and Isle of Wight strategy and the strategic thinking there for the national one as well. So three big goals. The first is to make sure that we're putting nature in recovery. And what does that mean? How are we going to make that happen? Well, I always say there's three broad bits of it. Number one, we've got to make more space for nature, which is why we talk about making sure we get 30% of our land and sea in recovery for nature by 2030. At the moment, we estimate only around 5% is actually in a good state for nature so there's a long way to go to get to 30 percent but that's broadly what scientists say is the minimum amount that's needed if we're going to turn around those graphs turn around those trends and start to see uh, uh, wildlife species pointing in the right direction and actually recovery of nature at least 30 percent of course it's not just the quantity it's got to be that that's joined up uh, are connected so that we've got a nature recovery network at the at the bones the absolute fundamentals of that 30%. And then there's a hope that we can start to see nature put in recovery. But of course, we also care massively about what's happening in the other 70%. And so right across uh, the, the whole of our land and sea, we want to be working to restore the abundance of nature. What does that mean? What it means, for example, using far fewer pesticides in the countryside so that we can actually turn around those declines in abundance. In my lifetime, since the early 1970s, 41% of our wildlife species have declined in abundance in the UK. That's not good, is it? And of course, if our wildlife species are declining in abundance, they're not going to be doing the job that nature expects them to do as well. You can't have bees pollinating if actually they're in very low numbers uh, in the way that we need them to. So restoring the abundance of nature is also really important for the third bit, which is just getting nature working again. You know, when you stop to think about it, it's amazing how much uh, we kind of take for granted. But, you know, if our wetlands are not wet, if they're dried out because there's over abstraction or indeed uh, actually because of climate change or because water is being used elsewhere, then the problem is if our wetlands aren't wet, they're not actually functioning as wetlands. If our species are not in abundance, they're not performing the ecological tasks that you would expect them to do. Uh, and if species are missing, like beavers have been missing from the British landscape, of course, for hundreds of years, then they're not doing that wonderful job that beavers do as ecosystem engineers. So we've got to make more space for nature, restore the abundance of nature and get nature working again by getting our wetlands wet, reintroducing missing species and, and connecting up, joining the dots between those nature reserves and other protected sites. So that's what we're going to be doing right across the UK to get nature into recovery. And how exciting is that? 46 wildlife trusts across the UK, all focused on making sure that we do that and that it adds up to something that's ecologically coherent right across the UK to get nature in recovery by 2030. And of course, we'll be working in partnership with many other organisations to do that as well, the National Trust, the RSPB, Natural England, and so many others. Partnership working is very important for delivering that and working, of course, with farmers and other landowners. The second big goal that Debbie was talking about is people taking action for nature uh, to solve both the nature ecological crisis and the climate crisis. And on that, we want a particular focus also on young people. We absolutely want to see empower the next generation of people and support the next generation of people coming through to take that bold action that's needed to put nature in recovery. And we want that to result in better decision making for the environment at a local and a national level as well. And again, here we've really taken inspiration from Team Wilder, something that was developed in Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trusts. Now we're rolling out right across the country. And now I'm delighted to say that 40 of those 46 wildlife trusts are developing Team Wilder programs together. And it is our target that by one by 2030, we'll have one in four people in the UK taking action with the wildlife trusts on both the climate and the nature agenda. And the third, uh, goal is uh, nature is playing a central and valued ro role in helping us address those local and global problems. Obviously, problems like climate change, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but also issues about 
helping deal with uh, improved people's mental and physical health. My goodness, we learned over this last year, didn't we, during lockdown, just how important nature is, particularly local nature, to people's physical and mental health. At the Wildlife Trusts, we had a 3,000% increase in the number of people looking at webcams from our nature of the reserves in the first three months of lockdown, as people desperately try to find that way to co connect to nature when they were being told they had to stay mostly in their homes. And people, even Wildlife Trust members, discovered new nature reserves close to where they live that they didn't even know existed before as people try to seek that out. So it's clearer than ever now just how important uh, nature is close to where we live for people's physical and mental well-being, but also the role that nature can play in dealing with pollution issues. And again, Hampshire and Isle of Wight Trust have been at the forefront of offering the leadership about looking at how nature can play that role in, say, addressing nitrate pollution and other pollutants as well. So a lot to learn there. And how exciting is it? Just think about that. All 46 wildlife trusts across the UK, with almost approaching 3,000 staff in total across the UK, uh, all focused on delivering those three goals together. That's going to be really powerful. I mean, the other thing that's part of this is that we, uh, we're very proud of how effective the Wildlife Trust is already at the moment. But to actually deliver those goals, we need to go through some transformations as well to increase our collective capabilities. And we're really excited about that and how we can grow stronger together, working together as a wildlife trust movement. And I'll just touch on those now. One is that we're going to be really focused in this strategy on supporting and developing all wildlife trusts as strong and effective independent actors. Now, your trust, Hampshire and Isle of Wight Trust, is already a very strong and effective trust. Uh, but that means I know that Debbie's really keen to share some of that knowledge, share some of the expertise you have in Hampshire and Isle of Wight Trust with other wildlife trusts across the country. And guess what? Some of our smallest trusts actually might have things that they want to share as information that larger trusts like Hampshire and Isle of Wight can learn from as well. So it's just that we can all learn together and support each other to make sure that every wildlife trust is effective as it possibly can be. Secondly, that we're working really effectively as a distributed network. So they're all learning from each other, we're skill sharing, we're, um, we're making sure that we're joining up our thinking around how we can put nature in recovery, or we're learning uh, approaches like Team Wilder from each other. That will be crucially important. The third transformation, a real focus on inspiring community organizing and mobilizing along that Team Wilder approach. But as I was saying, especially amongst young people, we want nothing less than a youth movement within the Wildlife Trust in the years ahead, so that we can be absolutely at the forefront of making, uh, making sure that young people feel empowered to take that action for nature and the climate. We know already so many people, young people are doing that. I don't know about you, but one of the ways I've got huge renewed inspiration over the last two, three years is seeing the impact that young people are having on both the climate and nature debate. It's been transformational. And we need to absolutely make sure that the Wildlife Trust are at the forefront of that and the Wildlife Trust are somewhere where young people want to come and be able to take action with us. And we've already got many uh, young people doing that across the Wildlife Trust, but we think we can grow that in the years ahead. And again, that's something that we can do by working closely together. We also want to make sure that we go through a root and branch digital transformation. Uh, we've learned again over the last year, and, and look at what we're doing now, a, a virtual AGM, that actually digital tools provide a huge range of opportunities for ways for us to deliver impact and work in a way that we've not done before. Um, also, particularly around, say, driving citizen science, we want to look at how we can uh, encourage our members and volunteers and people that have never done anything with the Wildlife Trust before to use digital technology to engage in citizen science and learn more about nature and take action for nature. And that's going to be a whole area where we want to see a transformation as well. And finally, and last but definitely not least, we also want to deliver a step change in the scale and diversity of funding for nature's recovery. You know, coming into this job, I, I was really excited that the Wildlife Trust collectively have a collective membership of 870,000 people. To put that in perspective, that's at least twice the size of the biggest political party in this country. But you know what? All the indications are is that we could grow very strongly our membership over the years ahead. We've had strong membership growth across the Wildlife Trust over this last year. And actually, particularly as we invest in, say, digital membership recruitment and digital engagement, uh, we've seen big growth there from those kind of areas. And we've actually set a target of trying to get to 1.5, 1.6 
million members collectively across the Wildlife Trust by the mid 2020s and think how powerful uh, that will be as a force for nature and, and putting nature into recovery. So we're very, very excited about um, the ability to do that in the years ahead. And all that is to drive the change that's needed to address those climate and ecological emergencies. And I, I said, uh, here I am in Glasgow tonight, uh, came up here for COP26. And one of the things that we've been saying really loud and clear over the last few months at the Wildlife Trust is how critical it is for the world to reach net zero in carbon emissions as soon as possible, uh, certainly no later than 2040, 2050, because that's needed to protect nature. You know, uh, if you take something like the State of Nature report that was published by a whole uh, uh, group of NGOs in, in late 2019, it identified that the biggest uh, driver of loss of nature over the last 40 years, uh, 40, 50 years broadly has been agricultural policy. No big surprise there, perhaps. But actually, if, and I recognize it's still a big if, if we can get a proper transition to better agricultural policy in this country, and there's been some good movement in the right direction on that in a couple of years, and we've got to make sure that it's delivered and that the detail will be in the delivery and so on. But if we can do that, actually, you look at the huge increasing threat that climate change poses to nature in this country, particularly those species and habitats that have already been fragmented or declined. Actually, most scientists now think that climate change in the decades ahead will represent the biggest single threat to nature in this country and around the world. So no question about it, nature needs net zero to happen. But guess what? It's also the case that for net zero to happen, net zero needs nature. You know, there's no hope of achieving net zero and tackling the climate crisis unless we can put nature into recovery. Of course, yes, we have to stop burning fossil fuels, and this is not an either or. We have to do all those things to save energy, stop creating energy by burning fossil fuels, move on to that, move to the post oil and gas age. That's absolutely crucial to achieve net zero. But you know, we also need to suck carbon out the air. Uh, you know, at the moment, right now, we're about 420 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's the highest it's been for hundreds of thousands of years. And we're not going to get down to safe uh, to, to a safe climate until we can actually reduce the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that's the role that nature can play. If we can put nature into recovery, if we can put our peat bogs in recovery, if we can uh, make sure we have woodlands growing through natural regeneration, if we can get our sea grasses being restored, our salt marshes restored, all that will draw carbon out of the air, put it back in the soil, put it back into the from the atmosphere into the biosphere. And we might then just have a chance of getting to 1.5 degrees. And what I've been doing here this week and what we've been doing at the Wildlife Trust in the run up to this COP26 uh, meeting is making it very clear, talking about the role of nature's recovery and how crucial that is in helping us solve the climate crisis. It is a bit of a story that has, I don't think has been told strongly enough in the past. And too often, sometimes people, even in the environment movement, talk about climate and nature as if they're separate issues but they're inextricably linked. And that's the point we're making loud and clear here at COP26. And there's been some very interesting developments on that in just the last 24 hours. I mean, it's funny because right now, and it's only the first couple of days in, you know, I have to say this, I'm sort of cautiously a tiny bit optimistic if I can allow myself that we're starting to see some moves in the right direction. I mean, there's a mountain to climb, and we're not necessarily going to get there at the end of these uh, two weeks. And to put it into perspective, if we are going to try and hold temperature rises to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, we have to see uh, uh, countries come together and make pledges that would result in a cut of carbon dioxide emissions of 45% by 2050, uh, by 2030, sorry. Sadly, at the moment, the commitments on the table add up to around a 16% 16, 16 increase. So we're a very long way off. But what is encouraging, we've seen it just in these first 24, 48 hours, is when some countries start to lead and start to move, others will follow. And I have to tell you now, I've been working on climate change for a quarter of a century now. You know, if someone had told me even just five years ago that Saudi Arabia would come out with a net zero target for 20. Uh, 2060, uh, and uh, which is too late. But I mean, just the fact that Saudi Arabia has come out with that target, Australia has got one, 
for 2050. Or indeed, India yesterday saying that they've got a net zero target for uh, 2070. That's all too late, but I am confident that those will be tightened up over time and hopefully very soon. The fact is, when you start to see countries move, uh, the others feel they've got to follow. And we are starting to finally to see some progress. And I've been to many of these COPs in the past, many, many, many of these COPs. There is something that feels a bit different about this one. You can actually almost like see the fear in some of the politicians' eyes that they feel this is really serious now. And they know uh, that the people of the world will not let them off the hook if uh, they go away and don't deliver on this. And I'm not going to sweeten the pill here and say, you know, there is still a massive mountain to climb in what we've got to do here. But again, you look at the announcements in the last 24 hours about uh, finally tackling methane pollution, which is an issue that's long been overlooked. Uh, finally, that commitment about deforestation in the last 24 hours, uh, which is better than ones that we made before. Now we've got to make sure they stick to it. And for example, at the Wildlife Trust, we might be saying that we've got to make sure that it gets hardwired into trade deals so that we can make sure that that deforestation uh, targets actually uh, hold. But it's a really exciting time is that we're starting to see movement in a way that I've not seen for many years right now. Let's hope at the end of next week, I'm still feeling uh, just as optimistic or even more so. And this is all happening. Where it is happening, it's because people around the world, including and particularly actually here in the UK, are driving that change, are saying we want to see this change. And the politicians are responding to that, which I think shows just so clearly why this strategy that was developed with so much sort of input from Hampshire and Isle of Wildlife Trust that has that real focus on driving the bold change, but with people and communities driving that change from the grassroots, why it's such a right strategy for the years ahead. And so maybe, just maybe, with your support, we're able to deliver that. And when we get to 2030, we will be actually in a better world with nature starting to flourish again and actually are starting to get the climate crisis uh, under control. None of this would be possible without your support and those other 870,000 supporters across the UK. So thank you so much for your support. And I, I really hope you feel as proud to be as involved with the Wildlife Trust as I know I do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Craig and Debbie, two absolutely brilliant uh, presentations. Um, so uh, I, I'm just going to talk for a moment or two to encourage uh, our members to uh, put questions in the Q&A function, please. Um, Debbie, lovely to hear about our full 60 year history. Uh, and it made me realize just how much we owe those people who started the trust and everybody who's played such an important role in our trust over the last 60 years. And the other thing I, I took away from your presentation, which is very clear to us all, is just how crucial this decade is in helping to ensure that we do turn the tide uh, and put nature into, into recovery. Craig, brilliant to hear fr from you. It's been a real pleasure working with you over the last 18 months and thank you very much indeed for taking time out from COP. I, I know you'll be contributing hugely there. And one of the things, perhaps two things, just to reflect on, on your, your presentation, that the energy that you're bringing to that movement-wide element of the Wildlife Trust movement is absolutely crucial. It's lovely to hear how the movement-wide strategy has learned from ours, and we're obviously making sure that ours properly reflects that movement-wide strategy. But also, you've made a point, for example, one of your roles will be doing things like seeking to ensure that no imports of timber are in contravention of the agreements that are made. So it's not just the leadership within the country that's so important, it's, it's, it's getting some of those big structural changes that we know are, are so necessary. So we, uh, I will try and coordinate uh, the questions and answers and farm them to the most appropriate director or to Craig. So please keep those questions uh, coming in. Uh, some very nice thanks here as well, as they were indeed following the, the formal part of the AGM. So thank you for that. There was one question, by the way, which I did want to answer coming out from the previous session. Somebody asked, do we effectively, do we advertise widely when we're recruiting uh, new trustees? The answer is yes, very clearly. It's a very open process. 
and we have a, a, a pretty rigorous uh, selection process as well before we recommend uh, new trustees for election. So question here from Gordon, um, uh, asking us to say something about the introduction of white-tailed sea eagles, uh, the white stalk in Sussex, of course outside our patch, but we are aware of it. And I think you're starting to say wild boar, Gordon. That's a brave one. Maybe that's why you, you terminated the question there. But uh, Martin, would you like to say something uh, briefly about uh, introductions that we're thinking about and taking our conservation and science, uh, science advisory panels advice on? Martin. Thank you, David. Um, one of my favorite subjects, I have to say, um, reintroductions and, and trying to repair the jigsaw for this country, which doesn't look very much like uh, the near continent and our neighbors over in Europe. I think what I'd say more generally, uh, rather than going into any detail about those species, I think there's, there's, two, there's two perspectives here. I think as an island, we've, we've forgotten how to live around some of these species, which have remained prevalent in, in throughout countries um, very close to us. And that includes very urban areas. And I think we've, we've come to believe that the return of these species comes with conflict or challenges which might be prohibitively costly to bear or just too difficult for us to, to adjust and learn to, to, to live with again. But that's really not the case often. I think it comes back to looking at some of these reintroductions with where they have the power to reignite interest in wildlife and to recaptivate people and to create that normality of having wildlife around us again. And sometimes it, it really does take charismatic, very visible wildlife to do that again. But there's another perspective to this. Some of these species genuinely do act as, um, as, as keystones or as real levers for wholesale landscape change. Now that might be species such as the beaver, which can manipulate their environment and really offer real solutions um, that, that we need in a country like, like ours that we've modified so much. But if we just do take the example of the, the, the stork, whilst in, lots, uh, in large parts of Europe, they might not be such a rare species anymore, the return of storks to this country really do help to open up conversations about management on a very um, greater scale. So that, that means talking about return to species rich wet grasslands and floodplains and so on. So I think this is a really important subject that we need to have at the forefront of our nature recovery strategies and it's eminently doable. This is something we should feel really positive about. That's great. Um, Martin, thank you very much indeed. And I think that probably also answers the question Gordon and, from Gordon and Sophie about how important we see wildlife reintroductions as part of the broader rewilding process in the UK. Craig, there's a question for you from uh, Oliver Cox. How can we drive far greater synergies across the trusts to better free up funds, especially in marketing, fundraising, back office support and admin, etc.? To enable us to invest more in helping wildlife. Would you be happy to pick that one up, Craig? <laughs> I'm rather smiling because uh, David has been uh, chairing a group that's been looking at exactly this across the wildlife trusts. Uh, we do absolutely want to make sure that there's uh, we can find ways of achieving the synergies across wildlife trusts and to, to make sure we can be uh, as efficient as possible in, in that across the wildlife trust movement. I think it's not even just about efficiencies, actually. It's about that when we work together, then perhaps new capabilities become available that could never be available for an individual trust. Uh, because there's some things that there's some real specialism, some specialist skills or sometimes specialist IT equipment or whatever or packages that might be completely out of the ability of an individual trust to afford, but actually if we work together, all 46 trusts, we might be able to afford it and everyone could benefit from it. So it's about that side of things as well. Uh, so it's, it is absolutely something we're looking at. The thing that we, we need to be careful on this is what is precious about the Wildlife Trust is that each individual Wildlife Trust is, is of and from its own uh, local area and is an independent organisation. That's what 
that well that's what kind of defines us as well so we never want to have anything that might compromise the independence or of an individual wildlife trust and indeed the accountability back to its members within a particular county or uh, group of counties so we don't want to compromise that but if there's ways that individual trusts can work together and some of them are starting to do it on some issues uh, then obviously we'll pursue that if that saves money and as you say would make more money available for nature's recovery Thank you very much indeed, Craig. Um, there was a question here about um, a bit more about the behaviour change work that you mentioned, Debbie. Would you just expand on that a little bit, please? That's from Gemma. Thanks, Gemma. And uh, it might be more of a Hannah thing than me, but I think basically one of the things we're we're very mindful of is, um, I mean, there's some excellent work in the sort of field of social science, looking at how we can kind of mo mobilize and motivate larger numbers of people to act and to feel like they're part of something bigger. So the one in four um, thing that Craig mentioned is, is based on a, a concept in social science that that's the number of people you need to create a sense of a tipping point, to create a sense of social change. So that it is still a minority, but there's enough of a minority to start to influence the majority. And I think we're starting to see that actually those sorts of numbers now on things like the opinion polls, when you've got 32% of the public feeling like the environment is the most important thing at the moment. Um, but also bringing in um, behaviour change science around motivating change, socialising change, easing change and understanding um, what people need in order to take action. Through the Team Wilder programme, what we're finding is people are wanting to do brilliant things in their community, um, and then they want to take another step, and then another step, and then talk to other people and start to build that, that sort of movement. It's quite early days, um, but it definitely feels really important for us to be doing, and very much working to empower people to act themselves. So this is not about top down, this is not about us telling people, this is about empowering cheerleading, giving people a platform, um, and then really using that to kind of influence decision makers. And, you know, as Craig said earlier, this is one of the reasons why politicians are acting is because people are clamouring for that. Thanks, Debbie. Um, Hannah, is there anything you want to add to that or yet? Um, no, I'm, I, I think Debbie has summed that up brilliantly, actually, and um, it really does underpin all of the work that we're doing around Team Wilder and um, trying to build that group of people that are taking action for nature. Um, and it's actually, a, it's, a, it's a, um, a challenge for us as a trust to learn how to do that effectively, I think, to properly kind of support and empower that behavior change. Um, so it's a, it's a journey that we're going on along with those that are coming with us. Thank you very much. And I think that probably answers to a large extent, at least a question from Susie Brown as well. Question from Peter Gray. What are we doing to establish inshore no take zones? One or two of the harbours seem ideal uh, is Peter's question. Um, Debbie, I'm going to pass this to you in just a moment, and perhaps you might want to pass that on to, to one of your directors. But um, I just want to say that our new conservation and science advisory panel has got some fantastic expertise around the marine environment, as indeed has our new trustee, Julian, who you elected earlier. And we'll be seeking the advice of that panel on what more we can and should be doing in the marine environment. We also have some great expertise within the staff, I should say. And as Debbie said in her presentation, we've been doing more in the marine environment uh, perhaps over the last 10 years and previously to great effect. But I'm personally convinced, as indeed many others are, there's much more we could do. Debbie, would you like to pass that on to, to one of the directors to, to build on? Uh, again, Hannah, you might want to come in because of the secrets of the Solent team's work. But I think um, the first thing to say is we do have a number of marine conservation zones now um, around the Isle of Wight coast. Um, and as I said earlier, our work really helped to um, kind of identify where they should be and, and provide that evidence underpinning them. We also sit on the IFCA, um, the Inland Fisheries and Conservation Authority, and I know that we're feeding into things like the management plans, etc. Um, 
Marine conservation zones, though, are not the same as something else that we're calling for, which is highly protected marine areas. Um, and those are something that I don't think um, there are any yet, but correct me if I'm wrong, I may be wrong. Um, but the, the, that is something else that we really need around the coast of the UK, because although MCZs are protected, um, a lot of activity is still allowed within them, um, as long as that management plan says that that can happen. So currently, most of our MCZs still have a level of fishing in them. They still have a level of activity in them. And although that's supposed to be sustainable, um, I think it would be great if we could also promote this concept of highly protected marine areas that actually are fully protected from all activity, but we're not there yet. Thank you, Debbie. Um, again, Hannah, did you want to add to that or shall we move on? There was a question um, also about the Conservation Science Advisory Panel about the members, whether, whether they'll be rotated uh, after three years. Is there a list of current members? I think we probably have something on our website as to who the membership is. We did advertise very widely and go through a rigorous recruitment selection process. And I'd certainly like to think that um, we keep that constantly refreshed, but I'm really impressed with the people we've got on it at the moment. Now, a couple of questions about agriculture, which I'm going to try and join up. Uh, firstly, from Jan de Walden, I'm concerned by the fact that in the methane reduction debate, the media and the woke vegan brigade are trying to imply that livestock farmers are the primary source of methane and using this as an excuse to promote their own often misguided animal rights agenda. What steps can the trusts take to support our agriculture industry with this issue? And there was also something from Peter Gray, are we helping farmers move to regenerative agriculture to aid species recovery and carbon sequestration? Two really, really important questions here because I need to say, in fact, I answered a question in, in a different forum just uh, uh, this morning, I think. This trust is not saying that the only answer is veganism or vegetarianism. We believe very strongly that there's a balance to be struck. And in fact, some of the best and most sustainable meat is probably produced in the, in the UK through, um, through grass-fed agriculture. So, uh, and we have provided some great advice. Now I'm getting nods from the team here. Again, Debbie, you'd like to pick this one up and perhaps pass we, it on to- Yeah, I, we're all champing at the bit to talk about this uh, and we could all probably talk about this for hours. I'll, I'll just say one really quick thing. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really important, isn't it, that this debate is well informed uh, and is properly nuanced. You know, it's not a black and white issue at all. We need to eat less meat um, for global climate, but better meat locally produced is really important. Um, I was in Norfolk recently with all the Wildlife Trust CEOs and Craig, and we went to see some fantastic work. Um, at Wild Ken Hill, where they're doing regenerative agriculture. We've got similar farms here in Hampshire where, you know, they're using no pesticides, no fertilizer. They're using livestock as part of that natural system to regenerate um, fertility within the soils, crop rotations, but those animals um, and the dung that they produce is an absolutely fundamental part of that rotational farming system and helps that soil to sequester more carbon. Um, so yeah, it's really, really important that that kind of regenerative farming is part of what happens in the farmed landscape alongside rewilding of marginal farmland um, where that land is best placed to do that sort of thing instead. Um, but John, I don't know if you wanna come in and say anything on this at all. Uh Yes, a couple of points. Obviously, the, the trust itself is quite a substantial livestock owner and manager. And, and you know, at, at the peak of our requirements in the summer to manage our really important wildlife sites, probably have close to a thousand animals across all of our nature reserves. So, you know, they're an incredibly important tool. But as Debbie said, we need to eat probably less meat, but much better meat with higher standards of welfare. I think um, the National Food Strategy was published a while back. I think there's a really key element, and, and in my view, there's one key cornerstone to that that we need to make sure we hold the government's feet to the fire, and that really maintaining standards of agriculture for imported uh, foodstuffs. I think it's really, really going to be unacceptable if what we effectively do is export our methane to the third world because you know we want cheap food uh, and. And we're, we're going to place burdens on 
British farming, which we're not holding similar standards to. And I think without that, without the government doing that, then that whole strategy is on fairly shaky ground. I really think that uh, equitability of, of standards is, is a really important thing for us. And it's really important globally for, um, for dealing with methane and some of these other things. So I think um, th there's big things to do there. This is a global issue. Um, and, um, you know, the way I think we look to manage livestock in the trust and, and the way we need livestock ha has a really important role in addressing some of these issues that Craig was speaking about earlier. Um, but it's really important that we don't export that impact. Thank you very much, John. Now, hey, can, I just, do, can I just add a couple of points, if that's right? Yeah, please do, Greg. Yeah. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind, I think, in the agriculture sector here, there's a big difference between, uh, as Debbie was saying and then uh, John was saying there, a big difference between, say, cows, cattle fed on grass in quite open systems to in intensive livestock production, particularly where in these intensive farms, which are fed on uh, soya that's grown in rain for, rain, former rainforest areas. So the biggest problem we face here in agriculture, uh, UK agriculture around methane is not actually sort of farmers with those extensive systems and, and cows in a grass fed system. It is where rainforests are being cleared in the tropics to make way for soil plantations. And that soil is then used to feed uh, cattle in this country in intensive systems. And that's the real problem in this. It's also worth saying that although a lot of attention has been given to methane from the agricultural sector in the last few years, and it is a problem that needs to be addressed, and Debbie was sort of saying how we can look to do that, we should not forget the huge emissions of methane that come from the oil and gas sector. And uh, it's worth bearing in mind that globally, methane emissions from the oil and gas sector last year, which mostly is through leaky pipelines and so on, was equivalent to all the carbon dioxide emissions from the whole of the EU. So, you know, in, in having this conversation, we do have to tackle methane emissions, but it's actually the oil and gas sector, I think, uh, could and should have the pressure put on them to really uh, to stop those leaks from their pipelines and from their infrastructure. Uh, and we should not forget that in this debate. Really good points, Craig. Thank you very much indeed. I don't know whether we could finish with a, a, another question to you, Craig. The, the, the challenge is going to be to answer this in one minute or less, because it could take, you know, we could debate this one forever. But question from Guy, why do you feel that politicians are so petrified about talking about the impact of population increases on climate change? Even Tipner West has been driven by this. And by the way, thanks very much indeed for your su support on Tipner West and that lovely little video you did with Debbie. Are you able to just offer one or two little gems for us to finish on? Well, on the population issue, of course, uh, the, the issues about population is twofold. It's one, the number of people, and secondly, how they consume. So uh, on the side about the numbers of people globally, uh, actually, all the evidence is that if actually you want to encourage people, particularly in, in the global south, to have fewer babies, uh, then actually the best way to achieve that is to make sure there's uh, empowerment for women and girls and particularly access to education for women and girls. And that's what makes the biggest difference, all the evidence shows, for dealing with population growth around the world. So if, you, if that if concerns you, you know, we really have to push hard uh, on women's empowerment. The second side of things is that consumption point. And it's actually us in countries like the UK that are far worse at our unsustainable levels of consumption than many other countries around the world. And if we can really drive down unsustainable consumption in rich countries, that will make a huge difference on those resources. Uh, so I, I think, yes, sometimes politicians might be scared to talk about this issue, but I mean, it's never as simple as just the number of people uh, either. It's as much as anything about the amount that those people consume. And, you know, it's people like you and me that are some of the worst offenders in all of that. Thank you, Craig. And I'm going to uh, make that the last question, I'm afraid, because we're out of time. Uh, just a few uh, closing uh, points from me. Firstly, you should all receive a feedback form uh, electronically within the next few days. It will be really helpful to us if you could complete that because we do take such uh, account of how these AGMs go. So we'd be really grateful if you could complete those for us. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Secondly, huge thanks to Craig for taking time out from COP and I hope that the next two weeks prove really worthwhile. It's so absolutely crucial. Um, just to pick up on uh, a point that uh, John made, I'd like to express my personal thanks to the team uh, of only four people uh, who've coordinated this evening. The amount of work that goes on behind the scenes to make this seamless is, is phenomenal and they're quite fantastic. So please accept my thanks uh, for that. Um, normally now we'd, we'd be concluding with a bit of a chat as we go uh, around. We can't do that today. Uh, perhaps I'd leave you with the thought that we are so tantalizingly close to beating our highest ever number of members. I'm with Craig on this. I think we can double our membership by 2030. Let's all work together. And if we can punch through that, uh, that ceiling this side of Christmas, that would be brilliant. So if anybody, any of our existing members would like to give membership as a Christmas present, that would be absolutely lovely. John, uh, also our president, asked, is the glass half full or half empty? I hope that in sharing with you what we have achieved and what we aim to achieve, both locally in Hampshire and Isle of Wight, and also nationally uh, and indeed internationally with Craig's leadership, has left you with the feeling that your glass is half full at, rather than half empty, because mine most certainly is. Thank you very much indeed for your attendance and good night. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Craig.